Hello, and welcome to Collapse Club, where our topic is, how are we to live in the time of collapse? My guest today is Professor Christopher Scotese, who is the world's foremost expert on the ancient history of Earth. Hello, Professor, and thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. Hi, David. I'm glad to be here. Could you tell us uh, where you are now in your uh, career and what you have been studying all these years, please? Sure, I'm a, uh, I'm a geologist, that's basically it. I study the earth, I study the material of the earth, but I have a specialty, uh, which is the history uh, of the earth and interpreting what's happened in the past. Uh, and I've always been interested in the, hit, in the history of the earth back to when I was a kid and, and my career has evolved from uh, being a university professor. I've worked at various companies and, uh, and now I'm retired. So I'm trying to sit back and put it all together and I'm working on a book about the history of the earth. Recently, you published a uh, history of the earth's temperature for the last 540 million years, which seems like an awfully long time. Why do you work at that scale? Well, the uh, my my interest again is the history of the earth. So uh, you can't just stop at the more recent times. So I go all the way back as as far as possible. I'm just beginning to delve in the really ancient times, billions of years. But 540 is an interesting number because that's when complex complex life evolved, and that set into chain the whole evolutionary events and the changes in the environment and. There's a lot that's happened in the last 540 million years. Uh, some of it people know about dinosaurs and, and things like that. But uh, uh, to me, that's the most interesting part, the, how, his, how the earth has evolved, how life has interacted, how the environments have changed, and the evolution of what we call the earth system through time. Now, of course, the question that is on a lot of people's minds nowadays is what's happening now? the human enterprise over the past two to 500 years, and especially since 1950, has changed the Earth environment principally or in one important aspect by increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And now we understand that is going to have substantial and measurable effects on the Earth's climate. You, you have begun to study that. Yeah, I, I decided to uh, not only look backwards, but try to look forwards, use the same tools and techniques of telling a story and build, building, uh, building it from a variety of information. So uh, it's pretty obvious things are getting warmer, and uh, that is an established fact. And it's uh, also an established fact that CO2 is behind it. So I, I was thinking if I were to model climate into the future, the first thing I'd have to know is how the amount of CO2 has changed in the atmosphere. And that got me into thinking about what were the factors that both created CO, atmospheric CO2 and removed it. And uh, so I built a little class exercise that uh, essentially a spreadsheet where you can type in the numbers and see how the predicted temperatures will change. And when you put in reasonable numbers, what happens? Well, the, the the trends, the increasing temperature trends f follow the IPCC guidelines or models uh, for the next uh, half a dozen years. Uh, but then it begins to diverge. Uh, well, actually, to be fair, the IPCC gave us a, a variety of possible scenarios, depending on how much carbon reduction. And my trajectory falls, it's sort of in the middle, but the high middle of that, uh, uh, of that range. So the result is that in three, uh, 300 years, we'll see a temperature rise between four and a half and five degrees, which obviously is, is more than the two degrees that's predicted by the IPCC, or the guidelines anyway, not predicted, but the, what they would like to see. And uh, that's an increase in global average temperature, is that right? Correct, yeah, so that's the temperature if you were to average every every location on the earth, the temperature you get. Uh, right now it's about 14 and a half or 15 degrees, and it'll go up to about 19 and a half or so. Um, 
which in terms of looking at the history, the temperature of the earth, that's sort of, it's warm, but it's not the warmest times. Uh, and uh, uh, that's the nice thing about approaching it from a geological point of view, from an earth history point of view, is you get a little more perspective on how the earth has changed through time. It's hot times and it's cold times. We live in the middle of a, uh, uh, probably at the end actually, of a, of, a, of a major ice age. So the earth is pretty much as cool as it's ever been. Uh, whereas there are other times in the Earth's history where the temperature was much more elevated. So like the picture behind me, this is what the North Pole looked like 56 million years ago. Um, and it was a different kind of uh, earthly paradise. But uh, the, uh, so I not only can try to predict what the amount of te temperature will be like, but we can actually get an idea of what it might be like because the Earth has been in those climatic states in the past, uh, those warmer climatic states. And w one thing is that uh, we have the average temperature, but there's a big difference in temperatures between the polar regions and the equator or the tropics. Is that right? And we can expect that to continue in the in right. The new the, warm, uh, you know. When the Earth warms up, uh, most of the heat goes to warming the uh, higher latitudes, so the poles and the, the what we call the temperate forests. The, the tropical regions do get warmer, but they're already pretty sizzling. So the uh, the temperature difference is only a few degrees there, where at the poles it can be ten, tens of degrees, uh, so much so that uh, we lose the ice caps. And that's one of the great stories about we get from Earth history is the Earth has fluctuated between ice house times and hot house times. We are in an ice house time but we're pushing the uh, thermometer thermostat to a, so that we'll probably end up with the beginnings of a hothouse time, uh, uh, early stages of a hothouse world, which is what the Earth has been mostly, uh, mostly has experienced through time. So we're going to a hothouse. Let, let's look at the, at the map, can we? Uh, you have sure. recently created a, a synthesis of the temperature data back 540 million years. Um, shall I share it or would you like to? Um, why don't you go ahead for this one? All right. This is a heat map of the Earth's temperature through time. Uh, on the right here, uh, let me, sorry, I'm getting the pointer. I've never shared data in a broadcast before. So this is new territory for me. Oh, okay. He, here on the right, these are modern times. And we can see that the global average temperature is around 14 degrees. You can also see we have uh, ice at both poles, North Pole, South Pole. If I may, sir, I would like to play the student and point out what I think I see, some landmarks in this map, and you can correct me where I go wrong. Would that be all right? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Uh, this line here, which is a sudden excursion to cold temperatures about 65 million years ago, if I'm not mistaken, that's the extinction of the dinosaurs. Correct. And that's the imp great impact winner that didn't last very long. And even here, it's exaggerated but it was obviously enough to uh, cause one of the major extinction events. Quite remarkable. Then looking back here to about 250 million years ago, this is what I believe they call, uh, the, well, the end Permian extinction or the end Permian warm period that was accompanied by the greatest mass extinction in the history of the earth. Correct. Have I got Absolutely. that right? Absolutely correct. And uh, the thing, of course, to notice is two things. There's the height of the curve. So the average temperature is really warm. And so if it's 32 degrees average, that means at the equator, it's 40 degrees at least. And that uh, 40 degrees centigrade uh, is about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see some of the darker reds around the equator and up into the subtropics. And uh, I think everyone knows, every mother or father knows that if your child has this temperature of 104, that's pretty serious and mm -hmm. could be deadly. So that's sort of the maximum temperature that uh, the, our biosphere can sustain. Uh, and uh, and as a result, of, in the Permal Triassic, we lost 99% of everything that was alive at the time. Uh, 
but fortunately the clock got reset and uh, new groups evolved like the dinosaurs. Thank you. And then finally, uh, moving back further, here is a remarkable thing uh, some 450 million years ago. This sudden, uh, relatively sudden uh, cold snap, you have proposed a novel explanation for this signal in the record. Can you tell us what that is? Sure. Well, one thing I did uh, when I made this curve is I plotted in a different diagram when uh, large volcanic eruptions occurred, sometimes called large igneous provinces. I also plotted when major uh, impactors occurred. And, uh, and it turned out that there was a very good correlation uh, between the lava and the eruptions, and which were obviously put more CO2 into the atmosphere and the warm periods. And then the uh, impactors caused uh, cooling by putting a lot of particulate in the atmosphere, though for a much shorter interval. Uh, and yet we had, and we had this one major cooling event uh, back 450 million years ago, which happened at a time when the earth was very warm overall. Uh, so it seems to be an event rather than some slow process of cooling. The, uh, I considered, well, maybe it was a large uh, impactor that landed in what was the oceans back then, which is, is material that would have been destroyed and subducted. So we don't have any record. So it's just a a speculative hypothesis that's testable once we analyze the sort of chemicals we see in the rocks from that period. Uh, and maybe we'll find a, a crater, but I don't think so. It would have been as big or bigger than the impact that killed the dinosaurs. Amazing. Going back to the map for uh, a moment, I want to zero in on the present day. So I'm gonna zoom and this will be a little awkward, but I will get there. Right down here, this, oh, let me uh, make a pointer. This little squiggle right there, that's us now. <laughs> and if I'm not mistaken, the slight uptick on the right here, that indicates the warming uh, since before the pre-industrial age. Yeah, that's correct. Before the pre-industrial age, it was a little below 14 degrees an hour. Now this is, the graph is a little bit out of date. It should be actually closer to 15 or about halfway between the two. Right here. Now, if but I understand, you, I'm sorry. No, but you can see we have a long way to go to match some of the peaks that we've seen in the uh, not too distant geological past. Uh, but the but we're we're heading there pretty rapidly. If if uh, if the simple carbon budget model that I build is correct, in the next uh, 300 years we should get about to 19. On the that's scale. right here. So that's a that's a dramatic increase. Uh, of about it really is. Degrees. It's uh, and the uh, again, it's a it's not a it's not a guess. It's using a a simple model of a, car, a carbon budget. In other words, keeping track of how much CO two goes in the atmosphere and how much is removed. And there are a lot of assumptions and a lot of things we don't know well, but. It gives, with this model, you can play with the variables. You can change population. You can change how much energy per capita is being used, what the energy mix. So you can sort of see what the range of possibilities are. And, and uh, it's going to be somewhere in that range, plus or minus a couple of degrees. How long will it last, the new conditions? Well, most of this this uh, four degrees, it looks like it's going to happen within the next 150 uh, years because we're really pumping. We're at the peak of, of, of using fossil fuels. We're at the peak of uh, population, lifestyle increasing, all things that tend to uh, increase demand. So that puts more in the atmosphere. Uh, the question then becomes when we run out. And uh, there are various estimates of this. It's very hard to uh, determine but fossil fuels are a finite resource and eventually we will run out and hopefully we'll be transitioned to, to non-fossil fuels uh, in a major way uh, before that happens. Otherwise there'll be a, a different sort of uh, crisis. Um, anyway, say we run out of fossil fuels in the next three to 400 years. Uh, we'll have put excess CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, but nature has a way of removing it. Uh, and so it'll come down slightly, but it's sort of one of these two steps forward, a half a step back 
Uh, so we won't clear out everything that's been put in, but we'll reach what's an, a new equilibrium temperature, which will be below the high peaks of the Mesozoic and Cenozoic, but uh, well out of the ice age. In fact, we certainly won't have a North Polar ice cap. We may have some remnant ice on the highest mountains in Antarctica, um, but uh, uh, so we'll be in a, a as I characterized it earlier, sort of a warming uh, hothouse. Uh, but we'll probably be leaving the ice ages behind. And what will be the effect on human beings? Well, the uh, uh, if I painted a sort of sanguine picture of what the where, where we'll end up in four thousand five five thousand years, I guess it will take another four or five thousand years to get into this new equilibria. Um, the uh, so and that's that's a, a world that has the Earth has experienced a temperature a climate the Earth has experienced many times in the past. And it's, how it's been life as usual, evolution as usual. It won't, it's not going to be a hellish uh, disaster. Um, but getting to that is uh, is not easy because we're going from 14 and a half to 15, uh, 19 and a half degrees. And as you know, those incremental changes in temperature cause incremental changes in the environment, uh, hotter summers, more intense heat waves, uh, stronger hurricanes. And uh, so there will be damage and death and destruction as we get there. And so the trick is to try to figure out what are the most likely effects uh, negative effects, and then uh, use our resources as a, as a society to uh, to figure out how to mitigate or, or uh, unlikely that we can prevent those sort of things um, to help the transition between where we are now and where we'll be in the future. Uh, and then also people should just take common steps, you know, uh, common sense steps. The uh, uh, If you live near the ocean, you might want to think about maybe moving 20, 30 miles inland. If uh, if you live in the middle of a forest, uh, you might want to, if it's in a very dry area, you know, that's maybe some place in your, at least your future generations uh, might, might want to move out of. Uh, so uh, I think that we'll make the transition. I think there will be obvious difficulties along the way. Uh, in the Northern hemisphere, we're in better shape, though people don't like to admit this than people, than cultures and countries near the equator and in the subtropics where it'll be very, very hot. Uh, some have argued that the increase in temperature in the Northern hemispheres will actually open up opportunities. So we have to look for win-win situations where we can use this change to our advantage. Uh, to help make the world a more livable place. Do you have an opinion about the sustainability of the 8 billion people, humans, who now inhabit the Earth? Can we continue with a population of that size? Well, I was uh, always very discouraged by the Earth, by the, by the, by the rapid population growth. Uh, and uh, we can just look back when you were born with a population was 2 or 3 billion, and now it's up at 8 billion. Uh, and clearly that sort of growth is unsustainable and uh, would lead to uh, stretching resources far too thin and, and damage to the environment. But, but I was surprised when I did the research for my carbon budget that most projections or people have thought about this and, and, and know about more about uh, demographics than I do, uh, have the population leveling off and, and then even decreasing in the next several hundred years. So we, we shouldn't experience that sort of intense uh, population pressure that that would that has been that would be predicted if things were just to continue as normal i mean that's the same solution we're seeing with uh, global warming eventually we'll run out of fossil fuels so we can't use them at the same rate as we're using them now so something has to happen something has to give and i'm encouraged by the the trends uh, for uh, uh, non-fossil fuel energy solar energy all the things that uh, Elon Musk is doing, I think, are, are furthering our survivability into the future. Um, the uh, so I think we just have to be uh, looking for win-win situations and also just trying to uh, understand what the major changes are going to be. Do some real research and figure out who's going to be impacted by future climate change. The photo that you have in back of you portrays uh, the, the, the polar environment, that, the, that tropical forest used to be at the pole, I think you're, you're saying. Is, do I have that right? Yes, that's uh, basically uh, what, this, what that area looked like 
about 50 million years ago. So in, after the transition that we're now going through, do we expect the polar regions to become uh, tropical like that again? Well, uh, some some models have predicted that, and, and climate modelers are, this is obviously the future is an impossible thing to know from a scientific point of view. We can always speculate and have our models sort of invent a, a possible future. Uh, some modelers have temperature increases that would result in this. My model, it would still be a, a cold, wintry uh, times, uh, snow and ice during the winter seasons. So it, would, it would be much cooler uh, than is implied by this figure. So, uh, but the, the equatorial temperatures are about the same in both models. It's just, again, most of this climate change occurs above latitudes above 40 degrees uh, as that part of the earth warms up. Uh, there are all sorts of feedback mechanisms which accelerate the change in those places. The question I'm trying to reach is, would it be possible under this hypothetical scenario for humans to survive, that is to find food uh, at the poles under the new conditions or, or in temp more temperate areas nearer to the poles, assuming that the equator becomes less and less habitable? Does the food chain survive somehow? Oh yeah, I think the, uh, I think the uh, if we go from uh, equator to pole, the equatorial regions will be hot, but there'll still be life will be thriving there. A world like this is still a good place to live. There, there's a lot of opportunity, ecological opportunity, evolutionary opportunity. As we go further north, the desert belts will be very intense and there won't be much there, but deserts never have been a, a great place for, for things to live. And then we'll have something very different. We'll have from about 40 degrees or about halfway up the globe to the pole, an area that will be warm enough and sunny enough that you could grow very luxuriant forests and crops. So because much of the land exists in the Northern hemisphere now, as we warm those areas, they will become uh, um, more fertile farmland and more fertile habitats. And the pole would certainly be very livable, It'd probably like living in Western uh, uh, Vancouver or uh, right around those parts of uh, Canada where they, they, they have cold winters, but, but very nice summers and springs. Uh, so the, I don't see the, the, the future where we're going as a, a, a danger or a threat. Uh, so much as the challenges that are being uh, thrown up getting there, uh, because it's always hard to make changes and uh, people don't like to change, but things are going to change and we should try to identify those areas of maximum change and, and where the change is doing the most damage. Obviously, seacoasts come to mind and, and uh, uh, heavily forested areas. Uh, and just try to make some long-term plans, try to figure out well, what is the right thing to do uh, even just for our country, uh, that all seems, seems to work. If we could do it on a global scale, it'd be even better. Uh, and then uh, have the political will and be able to change our thought patterns so that we can uh, achieve those changes, make those changes happen. But, uh, do you have thoughts about the interaction between the scientific community, uh, which is well aware of these issues, and the governance community, which doesn't seem to be quite getting the picture about the urgency of what we're facing? Um, it's difficult. Uh, I always have had a more of a agnostic attitude towards politics. I, I realize politics is part of the reality we have to live in, but uh, science is a much better way to try to solve problems or at least come up with answers. Uh, I think the uh, uh, when science is politicized, it, it kind of demeans it in everyone's eyes. And uh, uh, so I try not to get involved in any political uh, debates about this or that. Uh, I think uh, democracy is one of the strongest uh, institutions that we have. It's been very flexible. It's solved a lot of problems in the past. And I, I'm confident they can probably do a pretty good job if we let it work uh, in the future uh, and not get in its way. A little more compromise and cooperation and having people realize they have a common interest in all this would be helpful too, but uh, but human nature is what it is, and that's always difficult. Thank you for that.
I, I I'd like to just take one one more question, sort of backtracking to the to the science or the projections. You mentioned sea level rise, and that's going to be a very very important change in the climate, is it not? And it will affect right. human society very deeply. Could you talk about that a little? Sure. The uh, uh, last year I wrote a paper. Uh, called The Seas Go In, The Seas Go Out, the history of uh, uh, how the Earth's surface has changed through time. So throughout Earth history, we've seen sea level changes, sometimes on the order of tens and hundreds of meters, such that the interiors of the continents, places like where I live near Chicago, were completely flooded by the ocean. So uh, it's a natural process, but it's, it's uh, being accelerated by global warming because obviously uh, when you melt ice, the water goes into the ocean and the sea level has to rise. So uh, the good news is we don't have too much more uh, ice to melt in terms of getting out of this ice age. It seems like a lot of Antarctica, but during the height of the ice age, there was, uh, there was ice covering much of North America and, and Europe as well. So the point is sea level can only rise so much. Uh, and it depends on how much of the ice we melt in the future. Uh, but uh, over the near term, we're talking meters, over thousands of years, we're talking tens of meters, maybe up to 70 meters, which uh, again, if sea level were to rise even a meter or two, that would uh, cause great problems along coastal cities. So they, this is something that they have to replan for. So like the Netherlands, they either have to build uh, dikes uh, and pumping systems, or, um, or if you can, you just have to move out of those areas. For uh, less populated areas, that'll be easy. Uh, but for big cities, it's going to be a real challenge and will require uh, re resources so that the system doesn't get overwhelmed by the freak superstorm that, that hits the uh, hits the coast. Okay, and finally, uh, do you think humans as a species are going to make it through this change? And also, is it important that we do so? Yeah, I think the... Uh, uh, I'm, I believe life is very, very resilient. Uh, the world will make it through. Uh, most of the animals on Earth will make it through. Polar bears will probably have a tough time, but uh, I like the seals. You know, I give, I'm, I'm always in the seal corner. Uh, the, uh, we will make it through uh, because we're intelligent and resilient and, and can adapt. Uh, our, what's, what's, what's troubling is that our society is kind of fragile. Uh, the institutions that we rely on uh, for everyday life, power and water, uh, can be disrupted pretty easily uh, and uh, by social unrest. So the challenge would be to try to minimize the amount of social unrest as we as we uh, experience these uh, events. Um, uh, I think we innovation is probably important, but we probably have everything we need right now to uh, to get through it. Uh, so again, I think it's a common, it's a combination of long-term plans uh, uh, and common sense uh, decisions in terms of where to live and how to uh, how to maximize uh, the new situation. Uh, but we'll make it through for sure, and uh, we'll be a seafar, we'll be a space-faring culture by the time this is all over too. So, uh, but I'm not saying we should abandon Earth for another planet. I think that's the wrong attitude. Uh, Earth is our home and we have to make our, our home uh, livable. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Professor Christopher Scotes of Northwestern University. Uh, I am David Baum in Seattle. This has been Collapse Club. Thank you, Professor, for joining me today. I find your synthesis to be uh, mind boggling and incredibly informative and it helps put humans into perspective on the earth and in the wider universe as well. So I just thank you. Thank you, David. Please like, subscribe and ring the bell. Until we meet again, farewell. <laughs>